Welcome to BD4, an RJ Carbone podcast. BD4, where there is no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. We also do MMA. Yanks every series, Knicks every game, MMA on occasion. BD4 is a five-star show on Apple Podcasts, also available in video format on YouTube and Spotify. So thanks for stopping by, and we hope you enjoy the show. Champion of the world, turning, looking, see ya! Anthony for three, bang! That one goes down and the game is tied! Time! Timothy creates and showing some dexterity as well with the left hand. Oh, 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 oh. What's up? What's happening, everybody? Welcome to the show. Welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, RJ Carbone, and you are listening to episode 430 of BD4, where there is no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. We also do MMA, Yanks every series, Knicks every game, and MMA on occasion, which we should have one out. Um, I know I keep saying that, but I'm planning on doing either a preview episode with a guest or a recap of UFC 281 with a guest. Um, my buddy Leo, who's lives right down the road from me on my street, plan on doing one with him sometime in the near future because UFC 281 will be taking place on Saturday, but we're talking Knicks, um, here in episode 430 of BD4. Yes, it's Tuesday night, November 8th, and it is already dark out. I mean, dude, it gets dark at like like 4.30 now because the sun sets. It's nuts. Um, it's crazy. Forgot. I totally forgot. I actually saw, somebody told me that they were going to stop doing that. So I had no idea the clocks changed. And then one day he's like, yeah, we changed the clocks back last night. Somebody told me that. And I was like, wait, what? So am I late to work? He's like, nah, whatever. Um, okay. <laughs> Sorry. November 8th. Uh, did you vote? No, I didn't. <laughs> I don't give two shits. Christmas is going to be here before you know it. Um... Jesus. I was reading up on the MVP thing last night. I don't give two shits. I feel like the World Series MVP should be talked about more than the regular season MVP. But I saw that Judge Otani and Alvarez are the three finalists. And how funny would it be if Alvarez won the MVP? I would, ju- I would even as a Yankees fan, just crack the fuck up because I don't care about those awards. The only awards I care about are the ones in the postseason. But <laughs> how funny would that be? <laughs> um, so let's talk Knicks. Let's get into it. Let's let's start the show. The Knicks defeat the Wolves in a late night affair. 9.15 p.m. start time. Um, last night on Monday night. For the Knicks, um, they were without Mitchell Robinson, without Quentin Grimes again. That thing doesn't seem like it's going to end well. Um But instead, they had Jericho Sims starting at the 5, and they had Cam Reddish continuing to start at the wing. The Wolves were without Rudy Gobert, uh, but the Knicks coming off a repulsive loss to the Celtics a few nights back where they gave up a a decade's worth of three-point balls, it felt like, needed to answer back strong. And Minnesota was one of the teams that you, you hoped they would have done that against, and they did. They answered back strong in Minnesota last night, knocking down the three-pointer themselves. Um, They connected on 19 triples at 40%, and they end up winning this one 120-107. to Uh, The mid-three combined for 76 points. My thing with RJ, Jalen, and and Randall, if they can try and score at least 60, 65 points together on average, 
a night, it's a it's a big win. It's a win uh, for the offense because that means you know if you, if you spread it around, that's an average of twenty something each. Um, and we'll get to Randall specifically more towards the the middle to end of this show because he was huge. Um, but Obi and IQ good off the bench. They combined for 24 points. If they can also try to combine for 20 to 25 consistently, that's also a huge win. Uh, Rose continued to struggle though, but yeah, overall the energy out there was out the gate. It was there, um, on both ends. The ball was swinging. Uh, the Knicks were using the screen and roll heavy. They played hard on defense you know, Minnesota did have some open looks early on, but as soon as like the second unit came into the game in the first quarter, after that second timeout, they tightened up, they started pulling away, and they started Ding up. So for the most part, the defense was on point. And listen, Tibbs' scheme will always be centered around rim protection. Guys are always going to be taking that half step in towards the paint off the ball. But the difference last night... Um, was just that the communication was far better. The communication was better, the energy was up, and so overall the team defense as a whole was solid. Um, But yeah, offensively, the Knicks knocked down 10 triples in the first quarter. They get off to a nice 10 nothing run in the second quarter thanks to the bench. You had Minnesota fans booing. Chris Finch calls for a timeout early. But that was really it. Minnesota was flat. Uh, absolutely flat. Nobody showed up. They were a straight dud for the majority of the game. Edwards had some moments in the second half. D'Lo was getting it going. But they did make it a little closer in the third and fourth quarters. But all in all, I don't think they ever pulled within single figures. And the Knicks end up winning this game by 13 points. Um, so, yeah, the offense was the story here. And I got to credit First and foremost, Tom Thibodeau. Um, you know, one of Tibbs' points of emphasis offensively since he became head coach has been for the Knicks to get a lot of three-point shots up um, and, and kind of streamline their offense a bit. But he also stressed, you know, he, he's, he's stressed before getting good open looks too, not just getting threes up for the sake of getting them up. You know, it's kind of like the uh, with the Yankees and Dylan Lawson's whole hit strikes hard philosophy, right? But the Knicks, I think they were averaging heading into this game 34, 35 three-point attempts on the season. Last night, they attempted 48 triples. So, and overall, they had eight more attempts from the field than Minnesota did. So that's one thing you have to credit Tibbs for. The ball movement was also fantastic, and that's exactly how they got all those open looks, um, playing in transition, but just moving the ball quickly in the half court from Brunson to D. Rose to RJ to quickly, the ball was moving great. Um, and, you know, Tibbs continues to show some leniency with the rotation. The small ball lineups again last night, we saw it. Obi and Randall. A little positionless basketball in there. He's been riding with the hot hand. Obi got 26 minutes. He was hot. We saw early in the fourth quarter last night, especially, yet Minnesota cut the one time 27 point lead from the first half down to 16 early fourth. What does Tibbs do? He calls a timeout early on. He swaps out D Rose and Evan Fournier. For Jalen Brunson and R.J. Barrett. And then eventually, with eight or so minutes to go, I believe Randall comes in for Hartenstein. And then with five minutes or something to go, quickly gets pulled for Cam Reddish. So you had, in the final six or so minutes of the game, Brunson, Barrett, Reddish, Toppin, Randall. Close it out. And I gotta say... That small ball combo, I kind of wish we'd toy around with that lineup even more. And I like that he's kind of doing it. Dare I say we should start a game with that lineup. I mean, tomorrow night, you're going up against the Nets. 
that's that really wouldn't be a bad idea because they have a small ball team themselves, obviously. It's an athletic unit. It gives them an offensive punch. They, they run the floor. And, yeah, the rim protection isn't there in the front court, but you have Cam, you have RJ going to be playing good defense for you on the wings. You know, those taller wing defenders are, are a big difference. But the bottom line is you didn't see Thibodeau do stuff like that last season. You'd see the Knicks in the midst of, you know, blowing a game in the fourth quarter. Tibbs would call a timeout. He'd scream. He'd yell. He'd do all that. But then he'd put the same exact unit right back out there uh, coming back from break. So it's good to see that. But again, you know, credit to him for using the creative small ball lineups a little more. But is it, you know, is it more... Mitch being hurt, that we're seeing that, we're going to have to wait and see. So I get the uh, hesitancy for some to to credit him, but however, the Fournier thing has nothing to do with injury. Fournier's run seems to be over, thank God. Is that, now is that more front office? You know, is that kind of them mandating it and forcing Tibbs' hand here? You had to think he was probably on the hot seat if the Knicks got off to another slow start. And it could very well be that that's the front office. However, you know, at the end of the night, I was listening to his press conference, and Tibbs did say he liked what he saw from Obi and Randall out there. He said he sees good things. And remember, you know, in the preseason and even last season, when reporters brought this up about playing Obi and Randall more on the same at the same time, he would immediately dismiss it. He would bring up garbage minutes as, as something that skewed their plus minus together, and he would find anything to dismiss it. So maybe he is kind of leaning towards just modernizing the offense a little bit. Um, and I don't, I don't want to spend this entire episode talking about Tibbs. So just a final few notes. Something to keep an eye on from him is is to just you know to see how these rotations shape up. Um, will guys continue to play? It's it's not always the minutes distribution, but it's the the substitution patterns. Like, will guys continue to play twelve consecutive minutes, and then they'll sit for a quarter and a half? Because that's been the big thing where Tibbs defers from other coaches is he runs you out there. It's all about how long he runs you out there for, right? At the end of the day, his minutes totals may not defer from from other coaches, but it's the patterns. How long are you out there for for at one time? Um, is he going to run run Randall out there for third quarters after third quarters every night? So you know, and I would like to see him try to stagger Randall and RJ and see them play with different lineups away from each other. But overall, I think Tibbs is is doing a better job showing more flexibility. We'll just have to see how real it is, how much of it is him. You know, once everybody starts to get healthy, Grimes and Robinson. Um, but you know, going back to Obi Toppin, he played excellent, and Obi Toppin actually, um, I'm giving him a Bing Bong ball. All right, off the bench, he was Bing Bong. Fifteen points last night for Obi Toppin, seven boards, three assists, four steals. All right. And he was three for eight from three. First of all, the steals. The four steals. He just displaying very active hands in the passing lanes last night. Obi's defense has actually been pretty solid this year. As a help defender, he really hasn't been that bad. He's never going to be a great defender, but I don't think he's been too bad as a help defender. Last night he did very good. Um... But, yeah, he continues to score the spot-up shooting, and that, to me, is going to be something that depicts so much with this offense, something that troubles RJ and Julius is when they're sharing the floor with Mitchell Robinson at the 5, the paint's clogged, and it's hard for them to get good looks. If Obi can keep sniping away, then maybe these guys have room to operate in that 15 feet and within area. So I really like what I saw from him last night. He's going to depict a lot 
with the offense, and he did everything. He rebounded too. He was rebounding, and that's how he's going to earn Tibbs' trust. It's going to be through defense and rebounding. So if 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 he continues to do that, we'll see what happens. But um, you know, if there's one thing on Obi Toppin, it's I, I just hope he doesn't fall in love with that three point shot and have to. Because I don't want that to take away from his big strength, which is running the break and cutting and running out those short pick and rolls in the, in the half court. But that's I guess that's a combo for another day. I'm not going to nitpick here. So uh, Obi Toppin played well. Um, but uh, going back to the ball movement, though, You know, I can't I can't stress enough how how much Jalen Brunson helps this team on offense. Last night he scored twenty three points, five rebounds, eight assists, shot nine for fourteen, couple threes, three of three at the foul line. But just being that floor general, man, he's he has such a good balance to him. You know, a good balance between knowing when to attack and also knowing when to slow it down and get the offense into a set. He's just methodical, patient, smart, and when he wants to score, he can do it. He gets into the paint so easily with that footwork. Um, he continues to knock down the mid-range jumper. Looking up his numbers earlier, he's 65% in the restricted area. For a small guard, that's good. And he's 45% on his mid-range so far. Also very solid. But he was scoring, man. McDaniels couldn't guard him early. D'Lo couldn't guard him at all. Scoring, playing good quarterback. And, you know, I, I criticized the contract. I did. But so far, it's looking like it's paying off. Um, you know, does he have deficiencies? Of course. Is he going to continue to drop 20 points every night? Pro- maybe not. Probably not. But if he's just a stabilizer at point guard, Gives the Knicks that quarterback they, they didn't have, then that's a win. Um, he was good, I thought. I thought R.J. Barrett, R.J. was also strong. 22 points, 5 rebounds, 5 assists from R.J. last night. 2 steals, he shot 3 of 7 on 3s, 5 of 6 at the line. Didn't end up shooting well overall. 7 of 18, mainly because he took some bullshit shots in the fourth quarter when it was semi-over. But it was a great night for R.J. Barrett. Um, he attacked the paint himself. He finished very strong last night. He had the spin move finish, multiple and ones again. Knocked down some more threes. Continues to shoot the free throws better. His head was up in transition. Made some great passes. Played strong on-ball defense with the two steals. He looks like he's found it. It looks like he's not pressing anymore, and it's it's you know he's starting to pick it up. So that's a, that's a positive sign going forward for RJ. And you know, of course, Julius Randle. Randle was he was outstanding last night, and I think this might be his first Bing Bong game ball. Bing Bong. <laughs> Yeah, Randall was great. I, I think Julius, listen, he had 31 points, 8 rebounds, 3 assists, 9 of 15 shooting, 8 of 13 from 3. He was 5 of 6 at the free throw line. Career high in threes made. He clearly took advantage of the Timberwolves scouting report because the Wolves were just leaving him wide open. On the perimeter. Especially early on. When he had five first quarter threes. But all night he was firing away though. Step backs and spot ups. Step backs and spot ups. That's how he gets his three pointers. And They were falling. They were falling last night. They haven't been so far this year. But last night. Yeah. He, he was tremendous. Um, now is it sustainable. That he's going to make. Nine shots. And eight of them be from three. Every game. No. But no shit. Like. That's 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 not sustainable with anybody. But you just have to hope he can hit him down at a semi-adequate rate. Um, 
you know, these are the types of games that do frustrate you with Julius, right? Because you see them and you're like, damn, I wish he, he has so much talent. You just wish he'd put these complete games together more often. It always seems like the average Randall game is great on paper, but not as great um, when you watch it. Because the eye test doesn't always match up his game because he's either not closing out on defense or he's doing the spin move a little too much and turning it over on the side and he's he's missing a lot of threes in mid-range. You know, it's always something to take away from anything good he did. Um, now, he did turn it over five times and he also had that one layup where he didn't really bother to contest after he got hit. That pissed me off, but... Overall, it was a pretty complete game for Julius Randle. Uh, does it up the trade value? Uh, does it give you more hope that he can sustain this success going forward to keep him and help this team? Whatever side you're on, last night was a positive. You know, It's not often you see both Julius and Obi uh, win a bing bong game ball together. <laughs> but um, yeah, I thought he was good. Kind of just bouncing around here on the notes. Um, I thought Emmanuel quickly was good. I thought quickly gave the Knicks a ton of energy when he and Obi Toppin checked in during that dead spot in the third quarter where the Knicks were kind of losing a little bit of steam. And how often do we see this, right? Where the Knicks need some life, the bench checks in, they give them life and the Knicks start playing better. These guys are the two plus minus kings. You know, I I, I want IQ to always be on the floor with either Brunson or D. Rose at all times. Because when he's on the floor by himself as the lead ball handler, I just feel like he tries to do too much. And to me, he plays much better, much more efficient when he's off ball. So that's going to be something I I keep an eye on as well. Um, I also thought he was good defensively. So... Now, Rose was off. Rose was just missing shots. He wasn't hitting anything. He was 1 for 11, 1 for 10. Um, the minutes continue to be minimal with him. He hasn't done much this year. He, he is old. He is regressing a little bit. But he's still just great to have a role on this team and just be maybe this year's Taj Gibson. You know, I, I think it's a good time to see if Deuce McBride can get some minutes here. You know, if we're gonna go, if we're gonna continue to short rows, maybe Deuce gets some meaningful minutes. I keep forgetting this kid's on the team. Um, you know, he's he was a popular name amongst Knicks fans towards the end of last year. They wanted to see more of him. Um, but overall, the defense last night was a lot better. Nothing spectacular. You know, it was the Wolves. They don't score, and they had zero energy last night, but it was much better than what the Knicks did against Boston. You know, they made the most out of their rotations last night. And again, like we said, it was the communication that was better. A lot of times on those screens and on those help side swing passes, Tibbs has guys rotate over and switch. I think a lot of times that kind of causes miscommunication because it's a, a bit of an intricate scheme. But last night it seemed like they were pretty crisp and they had it down pat. Um, Cam Reddish seems like he's finding a new home at that two-guard spot. Listen, he may not be what I really hope he can be as a scorer. I badly want him to show some consistency and be this you know, 10 to 15 points a night guy. But right now, what he's doing is fine. He's going out there. He's playing very strong individual defense. He's that tall wing defender that guys have trouble getting by. And He's playing good D. He's knocking down a couple shots from three. He's running the break and finishing a little bit. And that's all we need from him. Get a couple buckets a night, play defense. Right now, that's working. You know, it's much better than what Fournier was giving us. And, you know, also lastly on the defense and the rebounding and all that, the Knicks took advantage of the second chance points. Um, Having Gobert out helped us there. But I think having Gobert out you know, led to a lot of Minnesota defenders sagging more than they usually do, which gave us those three-point looks. Um, but on the boards, the Knicks were fine, and, and they took care of the 
second chance points 19-9. So, uh, Sims had a lot to do with that. I liked what I saw from Sims. I, I did. I'm 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 glad he finally got some burn. He got to start. You know, I thought he did well. Uh, I thought he played well defensively despite struggling at times with the fouling. But he was, you know, he was good. He was standing tall upright, defending the rim very well. He uh, he's a much better defender than Hartenstein overall. I think Hartenstein <laughs> He got cooked. He was getting cooked by Carl Anthony Towns. He was just going right by him. Um, but he, it's it's you know, the footwork with Hartenstein, not great. Um, he's not the athlete that Sims is. Sims can leap, we know that, but he also has the lateral ability where he's able to rotate out to the perimeter and defend there. Um, and he just he's he's the best in my opinion. Now that Taj Gibson is off the team, Sims is the best screen setter on the Knicks. And it's it's pretty evident. Uh, I I thought that was pretty evident the entire night last night that he had a lot to do with with getting good looks on offense because of his screens. He established that early high pick and roll uh, with Brunson and the other guards. He was setting really good screens, creating space. So I liked what I saw last night. I'm not going to take too much else from it. Again, it's the Timberwolves. Not that great of a team right now. Um, and you just hope that the Knicks can continue this going forward. Um, they are now 5-5 five and five on the season. They have beaten the teams they're supposed to beat. They have lost the teams that you don't expect them to beat. So, whatever to me. Um, and, and again, you, you just hope that they can continue to win. Knicks fans want to see wins. You know, I, I, I don't like getting into Twitter debates anymore. But I found myself kind of taking the bait last night I saw a comment and it was just you, th- this kid was talking about and of course it's it's a little zoomer with a selfie as his profile picture <laughs> I'm like oh great and of course you know zoomers don't like wins they're they have this loser mentality so he's like oh, all these meaning meaningless wins are going to keep Tibbs here and then they're going to get the Knicks into the play in it's like yeah no shit but these people who get angry at wins because they're mad that the Knicks aren't tanking, it's absurd to me. This, I'm telling you, man, this something about this generation and their infatuation with losing is absurd to me. I would much rather take the risk of winning and hoping you can attract a star than taking the risk of losing and and having that coin flip of getting the number one pick. I would much rather do the risk with a win. Winning solves a lot. When you win, things figure themselves out. I am telling you. When you lose, it never ends well. When you lose consistently, it never ends well. So I would much rather the Knicks try to continue to win, even if it means they're 500 and they barely slide into the plan, at least it's winning. At least it's taking a step forward and you got to start somewhere. Because if you lose, you're certainly not attracting a star. If you win, at least the odds are greater, even if it's a 500 team. Because that's the big thing. The Knicks still need a star. And you're not getting that by losing, even if you get the number one pick. Which, let's be honest, we haven't gotten that since Ewing. So, cut the shit. I'm happy they won, and I'm going to continue to root for the Knicks to win because I think tanking is horseshit. Um, so if Tibbs continues to find a balance between playing the young guys that deserve their minutes and winning, which is what he's done so far this year at an adequate rate, then I'm fine with it. I've told you guys this. I've got nothing wrong, nothing significantly wrong right now with what the Knicks are doing. They're going to lose games. They're going to win games. There's going to be highs and lows and ups and downs, and people are going to talk a lot of shit. But at the end of the day, if they find themselves in the fake playoffs, whatever, that's that's not far off than what the goal was, what the expectation was for this season. So we just have to co- hope that the young guys continue to play well because all of them are not going to you know stick around. Some of them are here to up their trade value, we hope. And that's the main goal. A lot of these guys, we just want to up their trade value to see if we can um, we can make that big deal, which was what Rose and and the rest of the regime came here to do. Him and uh, what's the guy's name? The 
the big shot, Steve something. The the dude who's World Wide West. That's his name. <laughs> you know, to attract a star. That's why they're here. So you do that by winning and, and you attract free agents and you attract other GMs if you're young stars, if you're young players and prospects play well. So that's that's what I want. That's why I want to see us win. <laughs> okay. Because I, I am done with not having a star. Um, let's get to break. When we get back, we'll wrap it up with the question of the day. Stay with us. Hey, guys. So if you are a listener of the podcast often and you want to know where to find me on social media, you can find me on Facebook at BD4. You can find me on Twitter at BD4Pod. And you can also find me on Instagram at Rob J. Carbone. BD4 is located on many different platforms. You can listen to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, and if you do there, be sure to give us a five-star rating and review. You can listen to it on Spotify, but you can also watch the podcast on both Spotify and YouTube. BD4 is available on many other platforms as well. All you got to do is search it up. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and much more. We also have a website now for BD4. If you go to bd4blog.com, you can find the blog, the podcast links, and also where to find me on social media. Just go to bd4blog.com. Studio 69 Productions is a podcast production agency created by Leo Rodriguez to allow content creators to market their podcast. It's an online platform that will market your podcast or any other project that you're working on. Get in touch with Leo Rodriguez from Studio 69 Productions. You can find Studio 69 Productions on Instagram at Studio69NJ. Studio 69 Productions, where dreams are heard and born. Welcome back to the show. Episode 430 of the podcast. I'm your host, RJ Carbone. Let's wrap it up with our question of the day, shall we? So for this episode, our question of the day, our NYY, NYK, MMA trivia question of the day is, in the 1989-90 season, Patrick Ewing led the Knicks with 358 blocks. Who was second on the team? In the 1989 1990 season, Patrick Ewing led the Knicks with 358 blocks. Who was second on the team? So let me know the answer wherever you can reach me. If you get the answer correct, I'll give you a shout out in the next episode. If you don't get it correct, but at least attempt to guess the answer, I'll let you know what the answer is privately in the next show. That's it. Appreciate it, guys. And I will see you in episode 431. I'll I'll have a Yankees episode out At the end of the week, for sure. It's going to be the one with Greg from Yankee Crazy Podcast and I. We're doing a collab, so it'll be on his show. It'll also be on my show here on BD4. So, look forward to that. We'll be talking about the offseason, the press conference, and and the the jargon that the Yankees use every year in their bullshit press conferences and our reaction to that. So, look forward to that. Guys, that's it. And I will see you in the next show. Later. This episode was brought to you by Anchor.